My name is Rosie Potasnik, and I am president of the Australian Friends of the Tel Aviv University, and I will be your MC for today's proceedings. I would like to officially open this virtual event in honour of the late Professor Louis Waller AO and thank everyone for registering and joining this historic gathering. We will begin by playing a short video on the Tel Aviv University called Welcome to the City of Big Ideas. Please open up your computers to full screen to get the maximum effect. Tel Aviv, thank you for your chutzpah. For the sweet music of Matkot on the beach. For your scooters driving everywhere they shouldn't. For serving salad without a plate. Bless you for that. And yes, in Tel Aviv, everyone feels at home, everywhere. Only you would create an app that makes drivers work for you. And the real chutzpah? What started as just another sand dune is now ranked first in the world for startups per capita. Thank you. Tel Aviv University for presenting the best of Israeli chutzpah. Thank you for thinking you can beat Alzheimer's by putting a brain on a chip. For fighting world hunger, applying AI to the Bible. How dare you try to print a human heart and succeed? Succeed in being ranked among the world's top 10 universities to produce startup founders. Thank you, Tel Aviv University, for your student entrepreneurs that are changing the rules of the game. Thank you for investing in the world of tomorrow. Be part of the next big chutzpah. Be part of the next big idea. Tel Aviv University. Is that not something? I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet, their elders past and present. It is with great pleasure I welcome you all today. We are thrilled to have participants from around the world and most especially the family of the late Professor Louis Waller, his wife, Wendy, his children, Anthony and wife, Michal, Ellie and husband, Michael, and of course, here in Australia, Ian, whose assistance was so valuable in the development of this event, and wife, Adina, along with their many children and grandchildren. To you, I extend a particular welcome. Louis Waller was a distinguished and an iconic leader in the Australian community. His values were driven by Zionism and his love of Israel. His achievements as a leader were diverse and truly immeasurable. Among those, he served as Dean at the Monash University Faculty of Law, Foundation President of the Victorian Aboriginal Legal Service and the first chairperson of the Law Reform Commission in Victoria. His work addressing issues associated with in vitro fertilization on behalf of the Victorian government led to world first legislation regulating the use of IVF. He served and advised numerous Jewish communities within both Australian and international communities and received a range of acknowledgements for his contributions to those who benefited from his wisdom. It is truly appropriate that we have honoring him by their presence and with their words tonight, our auspicious guests from Tel Aviv University, President Professor Ariel Parat and Director of the Tel Aviv University Law Clinics Program, Professor Omri Yadlin. We celebrate the presence likewise of our keynote speaker, 
the Honourable Kenneth Hayne, who among his own numerous prestigious roles served as a justice on the High Court of Australia. And of course, we look forward with great anticipation to hearing from the Treasurer of Australia, the Honourable Josh Frydenberg, Mark Liebler and Ian Waller. Professor Louis Waller was a governor of Tel Aviv University and a patron of the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University. 25 years ago, I attended the inauguration of the Buchmann Faculty of Law at the Tel Aviv University. The, the seeds planted on that day so long ago have been instrumental in bringing us together at this time. On that occasion, I spoke on behalf of my uncle, Joseph Buchmann, who dedicated the event to the memory of his late parents, my grandparents, Eliezer and Chaya Buchmann, and a plaque was established in their names. The inauguration took place in the presence of Israel's then president, Ezra Weizmann, and the Minister of Justice, David Libayi. Our distinguished guest today, President of Tel Aviv University, Professor Ariel Parat, was at the time a faculty member of the Tel Aviv Law School and was also present at the inauguration. 25 years ago, the grounds of Tel Aviv University were nothing as we see them today. You have to try and imagine what those of us in attendance saw as we stood there muddy fields and bare grasslands, empty spaces into the distance. There was nothing of the current stunning footprint of the state of the art and architecturally magnificent buildings, manicured lawns and lush greenery having since flourished in that place. What an achievement for so many of us who have strived on behalf of the university. Thanks to the generosity and foresight of my uncle, I am truly fortunate to have my own personal marker of the passage of time at Tel Aviv University. Now, each year when I attend the Board of Governors meeting at the university, I continue to visit the family memorial plaque. I feel blessed to be able to continue to honor my maternal grandparents who were victims of the Holocaust. Over the last 25 years, it has been a privilege to be involved with the Tel Aviv University and continue to serve this great institution. I am truly moved Rosie, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Is that, I am truly moved that we can now link and acknowledge in some small way the incredible life of the late Professor Louis Waller, AO, with the prestigious Buchmann Faculty of Law. In honor of Professor Waller's life and life achievement in the law, funds raised on this occasion will be dedicated to the legal clinic program at Tel Aviv University. You will hear more of the amazing work being undertaken by these clinics from a number of our speakers tonight. An evening such as this is only possible with the contributions of many. On behalf of my board, we thank Ian Waller for his efforts and assistance in bringing this night to fruition. We thank Mark and Eva Beeson, ABL and our, all our additional wonderful donors for their commitment to this event and the work of the Tel Aviv University. I personally thank Rabbi Gabi Kaltman for his beautiful renditions of our anthems tonight. Renee and Eva in our offices for all their hard work. And of, of course, my amazing board the commitment of every member of Tel Aviv University and AFTU here in Vic Victoria never falters. The AFTAU board and I welcome the opportunity to host this event. 
It has enabled us to honour and reflect upon the late Professor Louis Waller's enormous commitment and service to the law and to the people of Australia and Israel. On that note, I welcome Rabbi Gabi Kaltman to sing for us the national anthem. Not me, I'm not the rabbi. Please rise for the Australian National Anthem. Australians, oh, let us rejoice, for we are young and free. With golden soil, well for toil, our home is good by sea. A land about in nature's gift of beauty, rich and rare. In his feet, every state and bounds Australia play. In joyful. Shalom Ubracha, friends. Please raise your glasses with the whiskey you have received for Lachaim in honor of the late Professor Louis Walla, Rab Pinchis Yehuda, and Rab Yaakov Do Hakoen Bechaya. We wish his wife Wendy and the entire Mishpacha Simchas, blessing, Briot and much nachas. On behalf of Australian friends of Tel Aviv University and the Tel Aviv University, we hope that tonight's virtual event will be a fitting commemoration for his incredible life achievements in the law and the general community. May his memory be a blessing and his neshama have an aliyah. L'chaim, l'chaim, baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam I would like to introduce, introduce Josh Frydenberg, MP, Federal Member for Kuyong, Treasurer of Australia, Deputy Leader of the uh, Liberal Party. Josh was unavailable. Josh was unavailable to attend any of the planned events, but he agreed to do a short video in honour of Louis Waller who was a mentor and one of his law lecturers and who influenced him and many others in the direction of law. I should also add that even at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, when Josh was holding the weight of the entire economy on his shoulders, he valued his community and supported this event by making this video. Todaraba, Josh, we appreciate all the effort you've done for tonight. A year on from the passing of Professor Louis Waller AO, I'm humbled to join this virtual event, honouring the memory of a great Australian, a devoted teacher of the law, and a dearly misleader in our Jewish community. 
As a child refugee from pre-World War II Poland, he came to Australia with his family in 1938 and went on to have a significant impact on Australia, including as a passionate voice for the Australian Jewish community. Professor Waller's long history of service and dedication to students and to the study of the law dates back to the early 1960s, when aged just 29, he became one of the founding faculty members of the newly established law school at Monash University. He went on to become Dean and then the first chairman of the Law Reform Commission of Victoria and made significant contributions to scholarship in the fields of criminal law, evidence and medical law. His contributions to Jewish organisations were also significant. He held senior roles and was involved with many organisations, including B'nai B'rith, the McCaw Jewish Library, the Melton Adult Education Program, the Australian Centre for Jewish Civilization, the Jewish Museum, the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, Tel Aviv University and Jewish Care. Following his retirement, Professor Waller continued to teach and undertake research in the areas of forensic medicine and legal issues in medicine. The Monash Law School, as we know it today, and as I knew it during my time there, has been shaped by Professor Waller's profound and enduring influence. A towering intellect, it is significant that he dedicates so much of his life and career to the education of young law students. This dedication and influence can be seen in the extraordinary achievements of his many thousands of law students who have gone on to serve the community in many different ways. As we reflect on Professor Waller's life and wonderful legacy, we remember not only a giant of the legal profession, a giant of academia and our community, but also a thoroughly decent man. Following Professor Waller's death in October 2019, his son, Ian Waller QC, spoke of his extraordinary achievements as a gifted and inspiring educator and highly respected leader. But of equal significance, he said that his father's involvement and contribution in all of these areas never came at the expense of his commitment to his family. A truer word could not be said. Throughout my own studies and subsequent career, I've been a real beneficiary of his wisdom, his generosity, and his wise counsel. As a teacher and mentor, he was always approachable, measured in offering advice, and highly skilled in guiding his students in their own learning process. In remembering Professor Waller and honoring his memory, we are grateful for the lasting legacy he left. I wish the Professor Louis Waller Fund, Tel Aviv University, and the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University only good fortune in the period ahead. Thank you, Josh. I'd like now to introduce the president of Tel Aviv University, Professor Ariel Parash. I'm honored to be able to introduce Professor Parash. There were there were two genuine attempts made by the university leadership to come to Australia and attend the Gala Louis Waller function. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19 pandemic, this did not happen. Today, we are very fortunate to have President, President Parat address us live from Israel. President Parat, was Dean of the Buchmann Faculty of Law in 2002 to 2006 and was elected as the ninth president of the Tel Aviv University in 2019. In a recent development, I would like to share the exciting news that President Peratt has been named the winner of the 2020 European Association of Law and Economics, EALE, Lifetime Achievement Award. He is the first Israeli scholar to win the award. We are all very proud. Kola Kavod. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, 
just a second. Good evening and uh, shalom everybody. As uh, Rosie mentioned, originally, uh, Amos el Ad, the Vice President for Public Affairs and Resource Development, and I were supposed to meet you all in Australia and to take part in the event honoring the memory of Emeritus Professor Louis Waller. But due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this became impossible. And today's Zoom meeting replaces the original meeting which we had planned. Nevertheless, one of the first trips I want to make when traveling becomes possible is to Australia in order to meet you in person. I know that many of you are passionate friends of Israel and took part in supporting the university throughout the years. This is an opportunity for me to thank you for all what you have done for us so far. In particular, I would like to thank Rosie, Rosie Potasnik, president of the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University and Rene Spangin and their team of Australian friends in Melbourne for arranging this memorial for Professor Waller. I am delighted to see many of our dear friends in the audience like Mark Bissen and John Gandell, valued and long-standing friends of Tel Aviv University. And I can see many other whom I hope to meet in the future. Last but not least, thank you and welcome to all of Professor Waller's family, both in Australia and here in Israel. We at Tel Aviv University, together with the rest of the world, are struggling with the pandemic crisis. More than 140 laboratories at Tel Aviv University are working on the pandemic in related topics, from developing vaccines and therapies to designing effective and innovative tests for corona. Recently, we entered into an arrangement with the government of Israel to provide corona tests for the IEDF and other security agencies. We work together with the Mossad to offer the government an exit strategy from the lockdown we were in, and part of our plan has been implemented in Israel. Well, unfortunately, not in full, otherwise we would have been in a better position. Most importantly, recently, we inaugurated a multidisciplinary center for combating pandemics. The founder of the center is a person who you all know, the philanthropist Sir Frank Lowy. The center deals with all aspects of combating pandemics, biology and epidemiology for sure, but also economics, psychology, sociology, law, and more. Although a lot of our energy is devoted to the pandemic, we continue developing the university in many other areas, such as the globalization of our campus, advancing its multidisciplinary culture, and strengthening our relationship with the biomed and high-tech industries in both Israel and abroad. Another important goal of the university is influencing the Israeli society and promoting the interests of its most vulnerable members. In this regard, the activities of the legal clinics at the Buchmann Faculty of Law are more effective than any other activity at Tel Aviv University. Our legal clinics stand as a major achievement, a social startup which succeeded more than anyone could have imagined. Professors from all over the world come to see with their own eyes how our legal clinics work to understand the formula for their flourishing and continuing success. Indeed, their huge success is a miracle that could not have happened without philanthropic support. These days in the Corona era, the need for the legal clinics increases while financial support to universities from the government and philanthropy is in decline. Therefore, I'm so glad that the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University decided to focus their attention today on our legal clinics in order to encourage their crucial activities in Israel. As you might know, until 15 years ago, I served as the Dean of the Buchmann Faculty of Law at Tel Aviv University. The vice dean in those days was Professor Omri Yadlin, currently the head of the legal clinics at the Faculty of Law. Before taking upon himself this demanding job just a year ago, 
עמרי פאונדד a new law school at ספיר קולג' and later became ספיר's president. ספיר קולג' is located very close to שדרות, a developing town which has been suffering more than any other town in Israel for missiles shot by the Hamas from Gaza Strip. Almost all students at Sapir come from the southern periphery of Israel. Serving for four years as the founder of the law school and additional five years as Sapir's president is pure Zionism. Indeed, Omri is a person who does not only talk, but also acts. Having Omri as the head of the legal clinics secures their future success. I turn now to Omri. Omri, please. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, Ariel. And thank you all for inviting me and Ariel. Um, as you know, uh, it's morning here in Tel Aviv University. Uh, we are sitting here in our offices, Ariel and myself, and the faculty is in the offices, but the university is empty of its students. And this is quite a sad picture. However, the 150 students of the clinics are very active. They pay visits to their clients. They work on their assignments under the supervision of the 12 lawyers of the legal clinics and the eight academic mentors. So we have eight academic, eight clinics that provide service for people in need, free service. We have the criminal justice uh, clinic, the environmental and animal protection rights clinic, the Holocaust survivors and the elderly cl rights clinic, the human rights clinic, dealing mainly with discrimination and police brutality, refugee rights, workers' rights, dealing mainly with human trafficking, and consumer, consumers' rights. And this year, we opened a new clinic working in the Knesset with members of the Knesset on particular projects. So we have eight clinics. The, the, the purpose of the clinic is mainly to provide professional and ethical education for our students. We know that our students later when they graduate, after several years, they become leaders of the Israeli societies. They lead the biggest law firms in the country. They become members of the Knesset. They become government ministers. They become leaders of the high tech industry. And when our goal is to set them to become our ambassadors of social change, of social impact, of justice. And this is the education we provide them with in the clinics. The second goal of the clinics is to provide, and not, of course, not le less important, maybe more important, to provide free legal service to people in need. And the third important goal of each clinic is to make a social change in the society. I would like to demonstrate these three goals by taking one particular clinic, and this is the criminal justice clinic. The criminal justice clinic was the first clinic in Tel Aviv University and actually the first clinic in Israel. The, the clinic was founded by Professor Kenneth Mann with the goal of providing free service to people who faced the police and the public prosecutor in the criminal process. At that time, there was no government service for people in need so when you were accused of something in the criminal process, you had to find your own lawyer and fund it. And if you couldn't afford it, you ended up without representation in the criminal process. And so the goal of the clinic, the first goal, was to provide legal service to these people who couldn't afford representation. The second goal, of course, was to provide legal education to our students. And the third 
was to lobby the government, to lobby the Knesset, to found government service for criminal rights. Indeed, four years after the criminal justice clinic started, it was able to persuade the government and the Knesset to found an agency, a government agency that would pro that provides free service to people in need that face the criminal, pro criminal process. Sure enough, the first head of the public defense office in the Israeli government was Professor Kenneth Mann, who founded the clinic. Sure enough, the current head of this agency is a former student of ours, a veteran of this clinic. So you can see that each clinic has its own agenda, public agenda. It, it has its own unique type of clients and it has a group of students, enthusiastic students that go, up, go out to the world and uh, provide these services. I invited one of these students here to this forum, distinguished forum, and this is Nofar. Nofar is, is a third year student nowadays in the, clean, in the law school. Last year, she served in the Holocaust Survivors Clinic, and she would will tell us a bit about her experience in this clinic. Nofar, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, I'm so excited to be here and it's such an honor to speak with you today um, and to share with you my personal experience in the clinic. So a little bit about myself, uh, I actually always wanted to be a doctor, a physician, and I started uh, uh, my neuroscience studies at Tel Aviv University and I actually figured out that that's not the way I want to help people that the way that I want to work with people is much deeper, wider, actually not just to work with individuals, but to actually create a, a social change in a matter. So that's how I found my way uh, into the law school, uh, the faculty of Buchmann. And when you want to work with people and you want to influence people as a student, the clinic program is the place to do it. So of course I, I signed up and I, f I knew it was going to be a very, uh, empowering, empowering experience, but I found out that it was even bigger than I thought. And I want to tell you uh, about one case that really influenced me and showed me and demonstrate in my eyes how much the clinic can actually impact people's life. So one time we received a call from a Holocaust survivor who lived in uh, southern Tel Aviv and he just got his both legs amputated due to an untreated diabetes. So he called us because he wanted to know what are his new rights to find out what his new disability rate. And I went to him to a house visit. And while I was there, I found out that he ju don't just need help in extracting his rights. He actually uh, got his uh, uh, public housing contract with a, a public uh, housing company. Um, his, con his contract was expired and they wanted to evacuate him. And he actually hired a lawyer that represented him uh, against this company and lost and demanded him to pay him a fee of 120,000 shekels, which is an enormous amount of money for every person. And of course, for an older Holocaust survivor who lives in a public housing. So when I told this to uh, the lawyers who I worked with at the clinic, at this moment, we decided not just to help him extract his rights and make sure he'll get all the nursing hours and all the uh, pensions, nursing pensions he's uh, entitled to, but also represent him against the public housing company and uh, make sure they will prolong his contract. And even we took his case against that lawyer who took advantage of him. And uh, this case is still uh, hanging on. And that means that I actually realized that in one visit, we changed his life because he was in a big problem. He was in a big legal mess. And because we have the knowledge and the tools to help him, we managed to change his life in one visit. And it's not just we help individuals, even though we do it a lot. Uh, we also look at, uh, the clink looks at a much wider perspective, at the bigger picture. 
And COVID-19 uh, outbreak is a very good example because I always say that everyone who practice social change, uh, social service, services, social law services, know that COVID-19 is a social battlefield because the poor, poor children are in higher risk, women are in higher risk, and of course, elder people are in higher risk, not only the pandemic risk, but also a uh, mental, cognitive and uh, emotional risk. So we established a weekly forum with the Minister of Social Equality and every week the lawyers that we worked with at the clinics went there and told them about the problems that we saw uh, that our clients are facing with and we really believe that those individuals are representing the bigger picture of elderly and Holocaust, Holocaust survivor in the society. So one example is uh, the government uh, policy for um, nursing homes. The government actually instructed the nursing homes in Israel to reduce as much as possible the visiting hours by families. And this has a great impact on the elderly's uh, mental and emotional, um, uh, emotional uh, status during the pandemic and we insisted uh, in front of uh, the minister uh, that the, that he will harm them of course we want to protect them by the pandemic implication but there are other implications that we are aware of because we talk to them we talk with these people every single day and we manage to actually um, make sure that these hours will be increased back and of course with the protected needs uh, uh, means in order to protect the people from the pandemic implications but to insecure the uh, right to meet their families so it's two small examples from a very busy year with a lot of clients and to, that's really demonstrate how the clinic affects people's life, not only in micro perspective, also in macro perspective. And to see how these small actions by students really, I, I, I believe and I felt like we're really causing some social change and making sure that the voice of elderly and Holocaust survivor and their needs will be heard. And I uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to tell my story and thank uh, Omri and everybody involved for inviting me. Thank you, Nofal. And I think you can see that uh, the clinics is where, uh, from Nofar's speech, where is where uh, the clinic is where the brain really meets the heart of our students. Um, and uh, the, the clinics enable these students to experience something they will never be able to experience in their future career. Because here we are able to combine the enormous research uh, brains that we have in the, the faculty with the practice of the lawyers. So I'll give you an example. In the workers' clinics rights, rights clinic, we are now running an experiment of a new doctrine in employment law in which some of the practices that we are trying to attack, we try to define them as human trafficking. And once the court adopts our view that these practices are actually uh, equal to human trafficking, the whole system and the, all the remedies that these employees will be able to gain changes significantly. So in each clinic, we are able to establish and to run experiments with new legal ideas. And this is something that in the practice, lawyers in their day-to-day -day work, they will never be able to achieve in the way, in the deep way that here in the university, the combination between academic research and practice uh, can flourish. So uh, this is something that is very unique to our clinics and the students appreciate it, our clients appreciate it, and of course the government appreciates it. And despite the, way, the fact that many times our clinic works against the, the government in a way, the government officials appreciate our contribution. And in the, in the end of the day, they call us and they ask for our uh, advice and we have very good relations with the governments, even though we know that sometimes, often, we are on the other side 
of the table. Uh, so I thank you all for joining me, for inviting me, and for uh, assisting us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Omri Yadlin, and also Nafar Kadosh. Without you, it wouldn't be possible for our guests mm -hmm. to see how important the law clinics are and the purpose of why we're making this evening and donations around them. So thank you. Thank you both for coming on. Thank you very much. I'd like now to introduce Mr. Mark Liebler, AC. Mark Liebler is a senior partner at Arnold Block Liebler and heads the firm's renowned taxation practice for more than 40 years. Mark's leadership in the law has interconnected with his leadership in the Australian Jewish community. One of those communal roles in which Mark has thrived is with the Tel Aviv University as patron of the Friends and governor of the Tel Aviv University. In these roles, Mark has been generous and instrumental in promoting the work of the university. In summary, it can be said that Mark Liebler has been an excellent ambassador. Mark, we would like, now like you to start the introduction for uh, Kenneth Hain. Thank you, Rosie. Um, I've been given a great honour this evening um, of introducing our keynote speaker, the Honourable Kenneth Hain. But first, I'd like to make mention of the man we are here together to honour this evening, the late Louis Waller, who I had the good fortune of knowing for many decades. Louis was one of my law lecturers at Melbourne University and is widely acclaimed for his brilliance as both an academic and as a legal innovator. He applied and reformed the law to better reflect cutting edge innovation, such as IVF, and better support disadvantaged and marginalized uh, people. What is less well known is that Louis was for a very long time the universally respected go-to man for mediating and resolving disputes within the Victorian Jewish community where passions um, and opinions can and do run deep. So moving now to my role this evening, I guess it's a golden rule of introduction making that the speaker should never make the introduction about themselves. But having read in some detail about Ken's life and career ahead of this event, I have to say that I was struck by how closely our paths had crossed over the years without me having been fully aware of it at the time. And struck by some shared values we've developed on our very different journeys as lawyers. Values that also align with those of the late Louis Waller. It almost goes without saying, but should nonetheless be said that Ken Hain has had a stellar legal career culminating in his appointment to the High Court of Australia in 1997. <clears throat> he was regarded on the High Court as a formidable judge, extraordinarily hardworking, but also for the strong philosophical approach he took to the judiciary, an approach he rigorously applied to himself. Ken believes that the judicial function requires absolute independence and neutrality, and believes it, it right and proper that the judiciary be subject to public scrutiny. As a judge, he accepted the inevitability the judges will sometimes be required to make decisions that will be criticized by the political class and even sections of the community. 
This would never be a deterrent for Ken. Soon after the establishment of the Banking Royal Commission in 2017, a profile of Commissioner Hain in the Australian Financial Review described him as, if I can quote, an old fashioned judge who sees his role as applying the law, end of quote, suggesting that his approach to proceedings would be, again, in quotes, no nonsense, no frills, and relatively legalistic. This article provided a glimpse of Ken as a human being by noting that he's deeply interested in what is going on in the world. Indeed, in my reading about him, I came across a speech that Ken delivered mid last year at Melbourne University Centre for Comparative Constitutional Studies. The focus of the address was Royal Commissions. And after describing very clearly what they are and what they do, Ken turned to the question of why we see so many calls for new Royal Commissions these days and what it tells us about our institutions of government. The central pillars of a Royal Commission, which Ken identified as independence, neutrality, publicity, and the development of reasoned reports may be contrasted, he said, with the characteristics of modern political practice. Reasoned debates about issues of policy now are rare, he observed, with three or four word slogans having taken their place. As an example of this trend, Ken Hain, as a person with a deep understanding of Australia's constitutional framework, identified the mischievous debate around the Uluru Statement of the Heart and its call for meaningful recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australians in the constitution. Informed debate is only possible, he said, if information is read, understood, and used to make reasoned arguments. To quote, too often the information that is available is neither read nor understood, and even if the information has been read and understood, debate proceeds by reference only to slogans coined by partisan participants. Lawyers who view and utilize the law as an instrument of social justice, lawyers like the late Louis Waller and Ken Hain, play a hugely important role in our civil society. We should listen carefully to their unfailingly well-reasoned commentary. And with that, let me just say, it's truly an honor to introduce the Honorable Kenneth Hain to deliver this evening's keynote address. Thank you. Mark, thank you very much for the introduction. You are far too flattering, but uh, the audience will soon recognize uh, the limits of the flattery. Louis Waller was my first teacher in the law. He left his mark on me as he did with so many of his students. Almost everyone I spoke to at his funeral began with the words, oh, Louis was my first teacher in the law. What varied then was the manner of expression used to convey the gratitude, the admiration, and the respect all with whom I spoke held him in their heart, as do I. The depth of that gratitude, admiration and respect was and it remains profound. Let me try to explain why. I entered Melbourne Law School in 1963, the year before Monash Law School began. I entered as one of a class of 330 students. 
All of us were required to take an introductory law course called Introduction to Legal Method. Louis, not long back from his BCL at Oxford, took one of the three streams and I was assigned to his class. In those days, we were expected to prepare for each class and we were required to take an assigned seat in the lecture theatre so that the lecturer could pursue a Socratic method of teaching, calling on students by their name. The prospect of what we thought might be ritual humiliation in front of a class of a hundred was terrifying. But that terror soon melted in the face of what I would call the intellectual civility of Louis Waller. Even a collection of 18 year old first year university students could see that here was a man of great intellect and deeply cultured civility. Here was a man who was wholly committed to having his students learn how to read more intelligently and learn how to think and reason with more insight than they realized they possessed. And all this and so much more we saw delivered by him drawing out of the class what they thought of the problem at hand and by guiding the discussion with unfailing courtesy towards understanding how the issue might be identified and resolved. And the atmosphere in the lecture theater was usually electric, but it was never threatening. For me, and I think for most of my colleagues, this was a completely new experience. I and many others in that class came to the law with no previous exposure to it, whether as a subject for study or as a profession to practice. For my part, I knew no lawyers and I had little idea of how the law worked. And many of us came to the university as part of the first generation of our families to study at university. And for almost all of us then, this was the first time we had been expected and encouraged to engage in the intellectually rigorous identification and application of principles the application of which was not mechanical, but required judgment. And it's little wonder then that Louis Waller made such a deep impression on me and on, and on others in those classes. And the impression was formed by his intellect, his courtesy, his encouragement, guidance, and his ability to draw the best from his students. The impression was formed by his intellectual civility. It was 1964 at the ripe old age of 29 that Louis moved to Monash as one of the foundation professors of that law school. So we who had entered the Melbourne Law School in 1963 saw him at work only in that introductory subject, introduction to legal method. We did not see anything like the full breadth or the depth of his legal scholarship. And we, or at least I, had little or no idea of what had made him the man he was. 
Generations of Monash law students were exposed to that intellectual civility. Generations of Monash law students were marked by his teaching. Generations joined me and so many others in saying, he was my first teacher in the law. The breadth and depth of Louis Waller's scholarship came into more public view in his law reform work, to reference, uh, to some of which reference has already been made, especially work he did in connection with the criminal law. But as has also been mentioned, the pioneering work that he did in relation to the law governing in vitro fertilization was probably the most uh, publicly prominent demonstration of not only his intellectual powers, but his great wisdom and his humanity. Generations of parents in Victoria and elsewhere in Australia, whose children are IVF babies, owe so, as much to Louis Waller as they do to the scientists who developed and practiced the techniques. It would be impertinent for me to attempt a complete description of what made Louis Waller the man he was. But in Oxford between 1969 and 1971, I began to understand a little better some of what made him. Because I began to recognize the place he takes in a wider group of legal scholars that has had such great influence on Anglo-Australian legal studies, that group of scholars who fled Europe in the 1930s. Louis was born in Poland, came to Australia in 1938. Two other legal scholars whom I had the privilege to learn from in Oxford, Otto Kahnfreund and Gunter Treitel, also fled Europe in the 30s. Kahnfreund had been born in 1900, had been a judge in Germany, but fled to England in 1933 and studied at LSE. He was one of that group of German lawyers whose immense influence on English law is described in Jack Beetson's great book, Jurists Uprooted. When I went up to Oxford in 69, Kahn Freund was professor of labor law. At that time, Treitel was a fellow of Magdalen, but was later to become Vinerian professor of English law. He had come to England in 1939 as part of the Kinder transport. All three of these men, Louis Waller, Otto Kahn Freund, Gunter Treitel, were deeply intellectual men of learning. All three were great teachers. All three were men of great culture and unfailing courtesy. Each of them taught their students how to think. For all of them, only the best could be good enough work. And each of these three men drew strength from Jewish tradition and the Jewish community. Each of them made contributions to the development of law in his adopted country, which is indelible. And in doing that, each drew on the traditions of scholarship and intellectual endeavor that lie at the heart of Jewish tradition and the Jewish community. Louis Waller lived a life of service. I have spoken primarily of his service to his students. That's how I encountered him. But he nurtured his family and his community, serving all with unstinted generosity. Is it any wonder then that Louis Waller should have served on the Board of Governors of Tel Aviv University. 
Is it any wonder that he should have been a governor of Hebrew University of Jerusalem? Is it any wonder that we should meet tonight under the auspices of friends of Tel Aviv University, of which he was a patron? Is it any wonder that this event should support the establishment of legal clinics to provide high quality legal aid to Israel's most vulnerable communities? It is entirely fitting that the project should be described as it is. High quality, legal aid to vulnerable communities. Because together those three descriptions speak of the man whom I so fondly remember and whose legacy we celebrate tonight. High quality, Walla always expected the best from all of us. Legal aid? Louis Waller's life was a life of service to his family, his community, his students, to others. The aid will be to the vulnerable. Louis Waller served those in need. Louis Waller's intellectual civility stands as a model for us all. That is why I count it the honour I do to have been asked to speak tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kenneth. It was just wonderful listening to you speak about your friend and teacher, Louis Waller. It was just lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm now going to um, introduce Ian Waller to speak. Ian is the son of Louis Waller, is a member of the Victorian Bar. He's also an active member of the Jewish community. He's a trustee of the Hevri Kaddisha and a member of the National Editorial Board of Australia Israel Review. I welcome Ian Waller to speak about his father, the late Professor Louis Waller AO. Thank you, Rosie. Thank you for allowing me to share a few words on behalf of my mother, Wendy my brother Anthony, my sister Ellie and our families. Just over a year ago, a Shloshim service was held at St Kilda Synagogue to mark the passage of 30 days after my father left this world. At the conclusion of the service, a woman introduced herself to me. She was Rosie Potasnik, the president of the Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University, and she said she would like to do something to honour my father's memory. Since then, Rosie has taken it upon herself to make good on her commitment. Even when the pandemic put pay to her plans to hold a gala dinner at the State Library of Victoria, she pressed on, insisting that the event would proceed on a virtual basis. More significantly, she liaised with Tel Aviv University and formulated a proposal to establish the Professor Louis Waller Fund to support the university's legal clinics at the Bookman Faculty of Law. I believe my father would have approved. And that is because this project draws together a number of threads from the fabric of his life. First, it constitutes another link in the chain which binds our family to the state of Israel. Second, it acknowledges my father's long association with Tel Aviv University and particularly with its law school. And third, it recognizes my father's belief that teaching law does not merely involve the transmission of knowledge 
but requires an understanding that the law is deeply embedded in society and should be used as an instrument of justice. Our family's connection to Israel, like all Jewish families, extends for millennia. But more immediately, it can be traced back to the 4th of July, 1957, when my parents met on a train bound for Paris. They had signed up to participate in Machon HaKaitz, the summer institute run by the Jewish Agency for Overseas Students. And after traveling from England to France, and then by ship to Haifa, they spent almost four months in Israel. What began as a holiday romance led to their marriage and a lifelong partnership spanning more than six decades. My parents' connection to Israel deepened after my brother Anthony and my sister Ellie made their homes there. Annual visits to Israel by mum and dad followed, the last of which they took together two years ago, provided an opportunity to celebrate their 60th wedding anniversary, this time surrounded by their 35 children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. My father's association with Tel Aviv University and with its law school was strengthened in 1985 when he accepted an invitation to be a visiting fellow in the university's Sackler Institute for Advanced Studies. Although he had previously visited the university, this was his first intensive experience of an Israeli law school. Over a period of two months, Dad gave a series of public seminars and lectures on the new birth technologies based on the work that he was doing in Victoria, which was already gaining international attention. He formed a close friendship with Professor Amos Shapira, the then Dean of the Law School, and with Professor Asher Maoz. Reflecting on that experience of living with mum in Tel Aviv and working at the university, my father later recalled it as a wonderful time. His association with the university was amplified when he became a member of its Board of Governors. In 1954, as a third year law student at Melbourne University, my father volunteered to assist at a legal aid clinic set up by the law school to help pensioners who had no access to legal advice or representation. His first client was an elderly man who produced a tin of health food powder, prized, up, prized off, off the lid and revealed, to my father's astonishment, a dead mouse. The man wanted another tin or his money back. With the then fairly recent decision of Donahue and Stevenson fresh in his mind, my father drafted a letter to the manufacturer and about two weeks later, his client received an abject apology and a carton containing a dozen large tins of the powder. My father's support for university-based legal aid continued with the establishment of the Monash Law School's clinical program in the 1970s. He saw it as a way of providing practical professional training to law students and advice and representation to those who could not otherwise afford it. Not long before he died, Dad wrote that he could not number the students who had told him, often spontaneously, that clinical legal education and working in a legal service was the most valuable course or unit they had undertaken, and that for many, it had been a life-changing experience. For my father's name now to be associated with the legal clinics at the Bookman Faculty of Law is therefore especially moving. Our family expresses sincere thanks to Tel Aviv University, to its president, Professor Ariel Porat, to Professor Omri Yadlin, the director of the Law Clinics Program, to the Australian Friends of the University, so ably led by Rosie Potasnik, and to all those who have supported the establishment of this farm. We are also deeply grateful to Josh Frydenberg, Mark Liebler and Ken Hain, who spoke so warmly about Dad. 
Each of you was a student of my father, and each of you has since risen to the apex of your chosen profession in the practice of the law, in the judiciary, or in politics. Each of you has made an indelible contribution to public life and to the common good. And I know my father was proud of each of your, his students' achievements. Although I was never formally a student of my father, he taught me so much by example. And I know this is equally true for Anthony and for Ellie. Dad's love of learning, the importance of family, his considered speech, his humility, and his genuine interest in other people, regardless of their age or social status, are just some of the lessons we observed and absorbed growing up. Thank you all for honoring my father as you have. It is a source of pride and of great comfort to our family to know that dad's name and his memory will be perpetuated in this way. I'd now like to introduce, oh, thank you, Ian. That was just absolutely lovely. It was really just touching the way you put it all together. We so appreciate it. Hey, Rosie, and Rosie, would you allow me to say just one word, please? Oh, please do. Ian, uh, thank you so much for this uh, very moving uh, speech about your father. Uh, when your father visited at the law school, I was a young faculty. So although I knew about him, we didn't have an opportunity uh, to discuss uh, legal issues, but I know very well that he was a good friend of uh, Amos Shapira, as you mentioned, the former dean of the law school, and also, also Asher Maoz. And I'm very glad that you and your family continue the friendship of your father to the university. You are very dear friends to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariel. It was fine for you to interrupt. It was beautiful words of recognition and thank you. I'd now like to pass on to our treasurer, Marshall Segan. He's an amazing director and assistance to, to the organization. And I've asked him to do the vote of thanks. Please join us to hear what, uh, um, how we, this will all end with Marshall's um, feedback. Uh, thank you, Rosie, and thank you, Ian. I had some tears in my eyes when I was listening to your words and also from Kenneth Hain to hear such extraordinary people in the legal world, including Mark Lebert, pay such a personal tribute to this wonderful man. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm feeling very emotional. Ladies and gentlemen, what an honour and privilege for me to act as concluding speaker, to thank all those that made this wonderful and memorable event possible. I'm aware I need to keep it short and sweet so people can retire to their dose of Netflix or the evening news. Firstly, I must pay tribute to Rosie Potasnik, who has developed as an amazing president over the last two years. She has unified the board. She has drawn people in. She's got us all working. I don't know how she did it, but she's just got a magic to her. And she, she had the vigor and vision to conceive this event with support from, obviously, Ian Waller at the start was critical, Mark Liebler, critical, Mark Beeson and Eva Beeson, and obviously Kenneth Hain. Rosie shared the Friends of Tel Aviv University board enthusiasm in publicly acknowledging the life and great work of our friend, the late Louis Waller, Thank you, Rosie, for pursuing this project and just crashing through the barriers. I also want to pay tribute to our wonderful staff, Renee Spungen and Eva Landy, who've toiled for many months with great patience and persistence. I won't thank individually our excellent speakers who are so eminent, I'm a bit embarrassed to even be in their presence, but you've heard their wonderful words. They spoke beautifully about Louis and as I say, I'm one of his students from Monash. Uh, you can read about his exploits with the greatest hoax lecture in the history of the university in the booklet. I don't need to talk about that, but you'll see it all there and you'll understand how I retained a connection with Louis till a year or so ago when we had a little bit before his passing, we had a, a wonderful 
reunion dinner of the Hopes Lecture participants uh, at the Monash Faculty Club, missing our great friend, the departed Campbell McComas. I, won't, I want to pay a special tribute to Mark Beeson AC, Eva Beeson AO, Mark Liebler AC, Ian Wallach QC again, and Tel Aviv University President Professor Ariel Porat and Tel Aviv University Vice President Amos Elad for their special support and encouragement in the early stages of this event's conception. Without initial visionary backers, we wouldn't be here tonight. It's just an enormous project. And without these people supporting Rosie and our board, it couldn't have happened. We also must thank Jill Rosner, the Australian and Canadian Liaison Officer at Tel Aviv University, who deserves special thanks for her great work, as well as Ayana Siegel-Cohen, Campaign Manager, and Gil Sharon, our Tel Aviv University Technical Consultant, who has just kept us on the straight and narrow tonight. Friends, our late friend Louis Waller gave us all a clear pathway on how to significantly help others, often on a very large and lasting scale. We've heard tonight a very moving presentation by Nofa Kadosh, and as an ex-law student who did work at Springvale Legal Aid Clinic, I can tell you that this is invaluable for students as well as the poor people who can't afford a lawyer. We all take for granted a lot of our comfort in this country, and we now can help others in Israel who desperately need support and students like Nofa will help them and they'll become fantastic lawyers through the Louis Waller Fund. We also heard some very moving words from Mr. Kenneth Hain, AC, QC. And although I didn't become a High Court judge, I can share my personal warmth of Louis with uh, Kenneth Hain, QC, AC, and also Mark Liebel, who's obviously had an enormous amount to do with Louis over the past years. Uh, if you have not already donated to this wonderful clinic, please, I'd urge you to think about it. The Professor Louis Waller Fund has been established to support Tel Aviv University's legal clinics at the Bookman Faculty of Law, providing high quality legal aid to Israel's most vulnerable people. We can help them and we can help them right away. This is the time to support, not next year, not the year after. All donations in Australia are fully tax deductible and a link to donate will be sent to you after the conclusion of this event. We won't be pressuring you, we won't be chasing you, but please help. This is a once in a lifetime event for all of us. My sincere thanks to speakers, sponsors and donors and those who assisted our Australian Friends of Tel Aviv University board to put on this really special event this evening to remember how our friend and mentor the late Professor Louis Waller impacted on us and many, many thousands of other people. I also wish to thank uh, Rabbi, uh, Gabby, Rabbi Gabby Capeman for making the L'chaim leading to the Australian National Anthem and finally the Hatikva tonight to conclude this special evening. Thank you to everybody. If you could please rise for our tikva.
Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosie.